right, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves if you would, and then just say a little bit about what you're doing in your particular lab or, or line of work. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm Rob Bryson Richardson. I'm a researcher, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, what my group does is we use the zebrafish model. So we use a small fish. Uh, we modify those fish so that they have nemaline myopathy. And then we use those models to investigate uh, this disease. And in particular, we're currently focused on screening for drugs that improve the uh, swimming performance and muscle function of our fish uh, that we hope could one day be translated to uh, nemaline myopathy. Uh, my name is Johan Lindqvist. I also work on nemaline myopathy, of, uh, obviously. Uh, what I have mostly done in my work is that we have looked at different type of human fibers for nemaline myopathy patients and mouse models and looked into the amount of uh, the cause of the contractile deficit, uh, the patient experience, so what is going on on a single fiber level, uh, so exposing different amount of uh, the fibers of calcium, which is the activating molecule in the muscle that uh, cause the force production. And by different type of mechanical experiments, we could determine a bit what's, what goes on in the fiber and causing a contractile deficit. And then various t different types of drugs that can improve force production here, and we have been exploring that too. Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Laitila, I work in Helsinki, Finland and for a long time I have been studying nebulin expression and function and as you may know nebulin is one of the largest proteins found um, so studying especially the protein function is very difficult and I have been very passionate about finding out what different mutations do in the muscle and what happens in the affected muscle with uh, nebulin mutations and um, the recent project that I have been working with is a new compound heterozygous uh, nebulin mouse model that would uh, quite accurately match the underlying genetics of many patients with nebulin mutations. And uh, we have been able to generate a mouse that is quite mild in the overall phenotype, but we can see the same effects um, in the mouse muscle, muscle that has been seen in the patient, patient muscle. So I'm, really excited to continue working with the mouse and finding out more about the muscle function. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vandana Gupta. I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. So my group has been working for a very long time with Dr. Ellen Bex on identifying the genetic cause of nemlin myopathy. And over the past few years, we have identified many new genes um, in patients who were looking for diagnosis for a very long time. So I think now, we are in that era where we have plenty of genetic information on a large group of patients. And more recently, we have been looking for cures for nemlin myopathy. And my group is looking specifically, to, uh, specifically at nemlin myopathy patient with two different approaches. One is, can we correct the genetic defect in patients with nemlin myopathy and restore the muscle function? And which is kind of a more um, long approach because every patient comes with a different genetic mutation. So while we are taking lead with some most commonly occurring mutation, it will take a very long time. So in meanwhile, what we are trying to do is, can we come up with alternate approaches to stabilize muscle function in a wide group of patients, irrespective of their genetic mutation? And the good news is that in nemlin myopathy, the common biological defect is the defect in the thin filament. Most of the patients have weak thin filaments, and my group is working on alternate approaches so that we can stabilize those thin filament and find therapy for a bigger group of patients. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So what I'd like to do is have this really be very much discussion orientated. So if anyone has any questions that you want to lead with to get our discussion going. Mark. I know some of you are experts in the animal model development area. Can you speak to how important the um, having the animal model that recapitulates the human form of the disease is, and how come it's been so difficult to come up with a nebulin mouse model? How difficult is it to actually generate a fish that are you know, really like the human disease form? And once we do get there, um, does that make us much more clinical trial ready? 
Yes, it's a great question. So I can talk about the fish particularly, and I'll maybe let Yeni uh, answer about the mouse. So generating models in zebrafish um, has been, we used to have a random approach. We used to randomly alter genes and then try and find one that resembled nemaline myopathy. Uh, but in the last few years, with some of the genome editing tools you may have heard about, uh, we can now create mutations uh, targeting genes of interest relatively easily in the zebrafish model. So we, we have a model of nebulin. Uh, uh, my lab's also created a model of actin myopathy. Uh, Vandana has models of KLHL40, KLHL41, uh, and Alan's group are making additional models as well. So we can now start to create models for many different forms of nemaline myopathy. Um, uh, but creating them is step one. The other part of your question is, how well do they resemble the human condition? Um, so muscle in any animal actually looks pretty similar. Um, obviously, we know there's big differences between everybody in this room and our tiny tropical fish that we like to work with. But when we look at the muscle um, at high detail under the microscope, muscle looks very similar in any vertebrate. So in all the fish, the mice, rodents, um, it looks very similar. But what we need to do when we make a model is say, how well does it look like the disease that we're studying? So when we first make a model, we go away and do a lot of the tests that would have been done uh, on the muscle biopsy samples that were maybe taken during your diagnosis um, to say, do our mice or do our fish show those same uh, changes in the muscle that we see in the patients? We'll also study their function. So in fish, we look at how well they swim. Um, in mice, they look at how well they walk or their grip strength to try and assess their muscle function. And it's very important that we understand uh, throughout our research, we're looking at a model. So we want it to resemble the disease as closely as possible. Um, and whilst many of them do, and we believe we've got models we can work with now, it's also important we understand any differences because when we want to translate it, uh, the more similar they are, the better. Um, but of course, uh, we don't want them to be too similar. We want our models to be uh, much more uh, rapid in the laboratory. So uh, I've got a couple of slides I can show later, but our, our fish uh, grow their muscle and start swimming within two days. So what that means is uh, the process of muscle formation is very quick. Um, that means we can do experiments much more quickly. Um, you know, if we study people, we have to wait years to see the disease progress. Um, or onset. Um, and similarly, when we look at them swimming around, fish do that within the first few days of life, um, and they're very small, so we can look at many of them. So we want a model that recapitulates the disease symptoms and pathology, uh, but has advantages that lets us work with high numbers and do experiments very quickly. Uh, maybe Yeni would like to talk about the mouse. Thank you. Yeah, I, I um agree with Rob with many of the things and with mice it's um, possibly it's a bit closer to you humans um, in if you look at the structure only but then you have to appreciate the fact that it's it's a mouse and we're looking at the disorder that is affecting humans so um, we call the mice nemaline myopathy mice they are the models of the disease but I would rather call them a nebulin model because they um, we have to look at the muscle in more detail to see what this protein that is very similar between mice and humans is doing in the muscle and then we can maybe start translating those results into the human disease. But to see the exact same phenotype in a mouse, I think it's rather difficult um, to come up with. And also I think um, mice are very resilient in nature. Uh, so. The problem with the nebulin models has been that either we get a very severe phenotype with the mice that die within a week from birth, or we get a phenotype, we get the same um, structures, nemaline bodies that we see in humans, but the phenotype is very mild, because it's very difficult to model a milder phenotype in a mouse that is very resilient. So what we had to accept now with this novel model that I have been working with is that the in vivo phenotype is very mild. So we can't really see much of a difference in the running ability, grip strength, 
all those things. But when we go into the uh, structure of the muscle or the function of, for example, single fibers, we start seeing the defect in the muscle function. And I think it's very important to find out what these mutations are doing in the muscle, how the function is al altered in the muscle of the mice, and just forget about the fact that it's not exactly the same phenotype that we would see in a human, but we will learn a lot about the muscle function. Uh, and we need also appreciate the difference depending between different patients who have mutations in the same gene, but different mutations. So I know that actin, for example, where, it, where we have worked on two different types of mutations. One was presented in the mouse, the uh, uh, H40Y mutation, that caused weakness, severe weakness on single fiber levels. But they have also worked on a patient that had increased force production on single fiber level, but still was diagnosed with nemalinopathy and had a, a kind of mild nemalinopathy. He had difficulties walking stairs but on fiber level, he was stronger. So just the things that, and that's, this likely points to that you cannot have one core for all the different types of mutations. So one maybe is you need to find a tuning somewhere in the muscle mechanics, by the other it would just be a bigger muscle that increase overall force production, could help, but there's tricky tricks in here just depending on mutations itself. I want to add um, something about iPS cells. Um, in addition to animal models, uh, more recently scientists have been working on iPS cells. So basically, we can take your skin cells and convert them into iPS cells, which can be which can multiply forever in the in the dishes in the lab. And the advantage of using these cells is first they're closest in genetic composition to your body. So a lot of uh, therapies that we can try, there's a high chance that 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 might that that may work in um, human patients as well. And secondly, these iPS cells, we can differentiate into any kind of cells. We can differentiate into heart cell, we can differentiate into skeletal muscle cell, and see what is the effect of different therapies that we're trying in the formation of perfect skeletal muscle in a dish. And right now, we are not there yet. It has been um, very promising in several other diseases where they have corrected those cells in the dish and put it back in the patient body, and those cells have made healthy protein and restored the defect in patients. Um, we have a limitation with skeletal muscle. It's one of the biggest uh, organ that we have, but there's a possibility in future we may come up with approaches where we can take those cells, correct in a dish, and put it back, and they can make healthy muscle. So one uh, model system is not going to be enough to address the different uh, questions that we're asking here, but I'm hoping by a combination of different um, cellular and animal models, we may come up with a common uh, therapy in future. Yes, yeah, so IPS is uh, induced human uh, pluripotent, pluripotent cells. And the reason we call them IPS cells, as I said, like they can multiply forever in a dish. So you can keep them forever. We do not have to come and ask uh, you guys every single time we are doing an experiment that we need more cells from you. I thought, uh, Laurent, at, at the back, did you want to add something? I just wanted to add uh, regarding the animal models that um, it's very important to have um, mice uh, model or larger animal models also for the dose finding because dose finding in a fish is something difficult in a mouse uh, as long as it takes the drug by itself or that you give an IV then you can figure out the dose um, and the second point that, that we have to take into account is that if you have an animal model with a milder phenotype then uh, as you underline, there is a huge resilience of these animals. And um, let's take the example of Duchenne. Uh, the MDX mouse is not that, not that sick. Uh, it's really mildly affected. And there's a number of drugs that works on MDX. But they, any of these drugs could be translated into humans. So it's very important to, to have a, an animal model that is uh, sick enough, ill enough, um, to demonstrate the effect of the drug and, and an animal model in which you can demonstrate the, and, and find the right dose. If you, if you get it, that's fine. If you don't get it, that it means that you have to adopt uh, alternative strategy in the development, which is feasible, but 
decrease the robustness of the of the development. Yeah, I, I think um, I think what Laurent is saying, and uh, which we understand when we use our models to get clinical translation, you need to know a drug is safe, and you need to know it's effective, and so. Uh, the work at it's safe, we need to know how much to give, and that's where larger models are very useful, uh, and we can't do that from the fish. Uh, but in any of the animal models, if they have the disease, we can start to say, would this drug be effective? And so if, if you have safety and efficacy, that's what you need to, to translate. Would that, would that be and the summary? Dose, safety, efficacy, yes. dose. Yes, yeah. I think the dose is part of this safety. Can you repeat the question? Um, so the question was, are we anywhere near uh, finding a drug that may do anything? Um, so um, the work that I'm doing, which is funded by the uh, AFBS uh, and the Muscular Dystrophy Association, is to carry out a large drug screen in zebrafish. So we're testing uh, almost 1,500 drugs in our zebrafish model. And I have a poster out in the corridor. Uh, I'd be happy to talk through uh, all the details of with anybody. Uh, in any of the breaks. Um, I think the short answer is we're not close, uh, but we have got, um, at the moment, we've identified four drugs that improve the swimming performance of our uh, nebulin nemaline model zebrafish. Uh, these are very early results. Um, we need to confirm that with larger numbers, and at the moment, we don't know what those drugs are. It's, part, it's an important part of the design that we're not blinded and introduce any, we don't know what they are, so we don't introduce any bias. Uh, but what that means is we don't know uh, how well tolerated these drugs are, what they're normally used for. So we're testing FDA-approved drugs because the route uh, to clinic is much quicker than a novel compound. Um, but whilst it's quicker, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll be very quick, but it is the fastest route if we find something. So we will finish that screen this year, um, and then we will know what the drugs are, and then I'll be talking to people like Laurent to find out um, which of them might be suitable for clinical translation and working to get evidence to do that. Um, so I don't want to say we've, we've got anything yet, but that's, that's absolutely what the goal of our research is, to, to find something that will um, get to clinic quickly and improve the condition. Uh, I would say the drugs we're looking at, um, they improve swimming. These are not going to be a cure for nemaline myopathy, but we hope they will substantially improve muscle function and uh, that would be of great benefit to the patients, but also um, uh, give us time to develop some of these more uh, long-term approaches that may offer um, even better uh, improvements. I want to add that uh, my lab is approaching this problem from a dip different perspective, from the basic science perspective, how we can improve thin filaments, because that can affect every single uh, nemlin myopathy patient. And more recently, we have identified pathological processes that are common to different forms of nemlin myopathy. And when we down-regulate those proteins, which are toxic to muscle, we can significantly improve skeletal muscle function. So I think there are many labs that are trying different cures. Uh, some of them could be directly uh, fixing the uh, gene defect or mutation. Some of them could be improving the muscle, fu muscle function. Um, but as of now, we cannot say we have a cure, but we are all trying. I may also just add that um, even though the mouse model is very mild, it might not be the best platform to test the therapies, but it's probably the most useful at, that we have at the moment to actually find out what is wrong with the muscle. So for uh, developing any therapies, I think it's very important to understand what is happening in the muscle and what kind of processes there are that we could actually try and affect. So that's why it's very important that we have a model that lives long enough for us to study what is happening in the muscle. Thank you. Could you just introduce yourself, Laurent? Yes. So my name is Laurent Savet. I'm a child neurologist. I'm working in uh, Liège, Belgium, and in Oxford, uh, UK. Um, I'm very involved in uh, uh, several programs in Duchenne, spinal muscular atrophy, extinct myosibular myopathy. And my role is to conduct the trials, but also to try to, to make it and to think these trials the, the, the most um, uh, pow uh, powerful and useful 
uh, to bring as fast as possible drugs um, to approval. Um, so this is for me a fascinating challenge, uh, the memaline world, because um, obviously uh, there is a huge unmet need. Uh, there is several approaches that are, uh, in my opinion, not in competition but highly complementary. Because if you look what happens, for instance, in spinal muscular atrophy, there are several drugs now that are approved or being approved. Some of them were found um, using uh, basic approaches. Some of them were found using uh, screening, like this diploma. Um, and at the end of the day, as a physician, I'm very happy to have several approaches. Um, one for the newborn, one for the people who are already uh, grown up. So um, I think more than approaches is, is extremely important. So I, I, I really don't feel uh, all of this as a competition, but much more as a kind of toolbox that we are constituting for, for, for uh, the next uh, decades. So uh, we are going to organize in Europe and in the United States um, a prospective natural history study. And I appreciate and understand that, of course, it's l much less exciting the therapeutic study. But um, what we've learned from other diseases is that um, if you don't know which outcome is important, it, if you don't know the burden of the disease, if you don't know the natural history of the disease, it's just impossible to, to build a successful translational program. So it's very important for us now to know what we have to measure, how we have to measure, what is the variability of this measure, if we want to be successful in constructing a program with a very limited number of patients. To give you the example of Duchenne, we have been working during decades in Duchenne and we have only a drug that is approved for 10% of the patients and we are even not sure that it works that well. Um, because we had no idea of the natural history study, we had no idea of what to measure, how to measure, the variability of this measure, the change of this measure during time. And so we cannot afford to do the same in such a limited population. So that's why with Alan, with others, we are really now thinking about clinical trial readiness, to be ready to welcome in clinical trials all these drugs that these brilliant people are bringing to the patient's bedside. Thank you. In trying to keep with time, uh, if there's one other question, we'll take it with this group, and then we'll be moving on to a new set of panelists up here. So is there one more question anyone has? All right. Thank you all very, very much.